Thank you. Good morning. And um, thanks to the organizers for uh, the invitation. And I hope you will enjoy the talk. I mean, I, I try to make it partially pedagogical because somehow I've kind of noticed that with many young participants and part uh, advanced. So hopefully you can actually um, enjoy both sides. But I also make the plan from the beginning so you know also what you might be missing in the end and you can ask if you want to. And the plan is like this. I will first define uh, what uh, Wilson uh, uses the word fundamental because we often say we work on fundamental interactions, but this is actually a rigorous way to define the fundamental interactions that we can use, at least mathematically. Then I will describe complete asymptotic freedom and how you transit from complete asymptotic freedom to a complete asymptotic safety. I will construct, and when I mean construct, I really mean construct, a controllable asymptotically safe theory in four dimensions. Um, I will then describe the uh, A theorem, what is the uh, essence of the A theorem in perturbation theory, and how I can calculate it for an asymptotically uh, safe field theory. Then I also know that people here work also on thermodynamics, so, so we'll uh, show the uh, asymptotically safe thermodynamic uh, of, uh, sorry, ter ter thermodynamics for an asymptotically safe quantum field theory, and also confront it with, the, uh, we'll describe it, the F theorem, and show that the F theorem fails in that case. So you can't really use the F theorem in general. And all this is going to be precise. So then I will uh, speculate a little bit more. Maybe we'll wait just a second for you to sit down. Then I will uh, uh, discuss in a less controllable theory, which is QCD, uh, the different number of flavors in the multi-flavor case, so what I call the the QCD window is 2,0. So how do you actually go beyond the standard conformal window and how the QCD conformal window of 2,0 might look like? For example, by adding a synthetic safe window. Finally, I will translate it to supersymmetry, where you can make a number of precise results, I will call them exact, beyond perturbation theory. I will uh, lay down for you the non-perturbative constraints that we can use to constrain conformal field theories in uh, four dimensions. And I finally conclude. Okay. And I will show also how hard it is to make an, uh, and why it is hard to make an asymptotic safe field theory in supersymmetry. Very good. So, but my motivation, I mean, why am I actually interested in that? Is because if I look at the standard model, I see gauge fields I see fermions and scalars, in particular the Higgs. The interaction of the standard model are SU3 cross SU2 cross SU1. I would typically say the standard model is a gauge theory. But in truth, as soon as we add the Higgs, there are new kind of accidental interactions which are not driven by gauge interactions. And these are the Yukawa sector of the standard model and the scalar self interactions. The first is responsible for all the flavor program, and the second is responsible for whether or not the Higgs is what we think is the Higgs right now. Right? So that second part. And it will be very hard for LHC, at least for the uh, future, uh, to pin down the self-interaction of the Higgs. So this is the status of the standard model so far. But it is a fact that the standard model so far works. So we need to take that at the face value. And it can be embodied very simply into a schematic Lagrangian like that where you see, indeed, the gauge term, the fermion interaction with the gauge, a generic Yukawa interactions, the Higgs, and its own self-interactions. Of course, I'm sticking to a specific schematics, but that's what it is. And this is the summary of what I just said in, in words. And it's a fact that the gauge Yukawa theory describes the standard model, perhaps dark matter, but in three dimensions, the same Lagrangian can be used to investigate condensed matter, phase transition. If I go in two dimensions, you have graphene. If you go to higher dimensions, so this is actually the effective field theory for strain theory. So it is a fact that we need to explore gauge cava theories and try to solve them if we can. So it is a universal description of physical phenomena so far. Now, as I promised, 
Can I define a fundamental field theory? Yes, mathematically I can, and I will uh, go back to this. A fundamental field theory is a theory which is valid, and I'm setting aside gravity for a second, at arbitrary short and large distance scales. This can be achieved if you have an ultraviolet fixed point. This can be. And it can be trivial or interacting. For example, in this theory, I have an ultraviolet fixed point, and there's a Gaussian fixed point at the origin. Think of this Gaussian fixed point as a QED-like theory. And then the coupling gets strong. At one point, you will reach a fixed point. This theory, on this line, is well-defined both at very, very low energies and at very, very high energies. The theory is, uh, does not have any land or poles. These are other irrelevant directions. So in the recipe, you want short distance conformality. That permits to have a, a well-defined limit. If you ever worked on lattice quantum field theory, this is a, a fundamental requirement to be able to set in the lattice spacing to zero. And I want that to be a complete UV fixed points. For example, in the gauge of theory I showed you before, there are several couplings that one of them is either asymptotically safe or asymptotically free, while the others run wild, doesn't make the theory fundamental. So I want a theory which is complete in all the couplings. The dimension of the critical surface at the interacting fixed points define for you the um, predict predictiveness of the theory, right? It tells you the surface uh, of uh, relevant directions. In this case, for example, in these two uh, couplings, it is one dimension, okay? It's as predictive as QCD. And if you have some mass operators, say, for example, the mass of the Higgs, we often say the mass of the Higgs is a relevant operator. That is true from the infrared physics point of view, not from the ultraviolet point of view. Right? Unless the anomalous potential of the Higgs runs wild, a mass of the Higgs is irrelevant from the ultraviolet physics only cares about the low energy physics, it drives you away from a potential low energy fixed point or the low energy dynamics. So the hierarchy problem, if you still like to discuss about the hierarchy problem, is not a UV problem, it's an infrared problem. It's stabilization of the infrared scale. Now, according to uh, Wilson, the standard model is not a fundamental field theory because it does not have a either interacting or elementary uh, or a non-interacting fixed point in the ultraviolet. One of the famous examples of uh, a theory which is well defined is, of course, QCD, which uh, we know is asymptotically free. And that means that there is a trivial ultraviolet fixed point. Means that, and this is the cartoon of the coupling, at high energy the coupling reaches a non-interacting fixed point, and it reaches it logarithmically. However, in the, uh, that's what I just said. However, in, uh, in, uh, in, in you can determine precisely in perturbation theory because it's actually non-interacting. So it's enough of one loop to dictate the information around here. The situation gets more interesting in this case in infrared because different phases can be envisioned in infrared. And this has been a long program, so it's been still going on to what is the physics in infrared, for example, if you change the number of flavors. But imagine you have a theory where, for example, I add also scalars. And the theory in the gauge coupling has a perturbative uh, ultraviolet trivial fixed point. Then I would require, for example, that all the marginal couplings vanish in the ultraviolet. These are called the complete asymptotically free conditions. It can be all of the deuce down one loop for all the couplings. You can demonstrate that you do need the gauge coupling to drive complete asymptotic freedom. And of course, in infrared, you can still have either, for example, chirosymmetry breaking, confinement, and so forth and so on. An example of why do you need uh, the uh, gauge coupling, imagine if you have any Yukawa interactions at one loop, you have the, uh, this is the Yukawa interaction. See, this is the second coefficient, typically positive, and that's what you typically uh, uh, say that this, this theory is uh, landau po because it grows quadratically with alpha. And this has, a, uh, because of the interaction with the gauge, the C1 coefficient is typically negative. So by adjusting alpha h as an initial condition, you can make the second term win. And this will drive you alpha h to be asymptotically free. I can be more specific and look at the phase diagram here. I have alpha h and alpha g. 
you can see that for the values of alpha h below the, above this uh, uh, line, fixed point line, you can see that uh, the uh, alpha h is not well defined in ultraviolet. I mean, my other such that uh, the, this goes to the, toward the infrared. And if I try to go to ultraviolet, alpha h explodes at least in perturbation theory. However, if I start in the region of the parameter space below this green line, you see that both alpha h and alpha g vanishes close to the ultraviolet fixed point. And therefore, this theory is a Wilsonian theory, and it admits a continuum limit. So the same gauge of Kava theory can describe either a not well-defined theory in the ultraviolet, at least in perturbation theory, and a completely well-defined theory in the ultraviolet. We're only scratching the surface of these theories. Uh, this is not a new idea. And that's why I typically did not present very much in the past, because it goes back to Chang, Aitin, and Lee, and then Callaway wrote even a report about that. And then it was recently reprehended. And in the paper with uh, Claudio and Thomas, we looked actually at the high order corrections where you also see the infrared fixed point emerging in these theories. Very good. That all I want to say about complete asymptotically free field theories. Um, so, in summary, they have a non-interacting ultraviolet fixed point, and they have a logarithm scale dependence in the high energy. But there is another possibility that might actually happen uh, in the ultraviolet, and you have, in fact, an interacting fixed point. In this case, you reach, oh, sorry, I was a bit too fast. In this case, oops, it's too fast. It's, it's, it doesn't, I mean, you can see when it goes from logarithm to power law, you feel it. <laughs> so, good. So now you see that um, I am reaching the ultraviolet fixed point, an interacting one, and now I, inter I reach it with a power law, which means that the critical exponents or the scaling exponent will not vanish in this case. Does a theory like this exist? I, I know that this uh, community has been working very hard for uh, gravity to try to demonstrate whether a gravitational theory were, in fact, asymptotically safe. And there are examples in two dimensions, three dimensions, and so forth, so on, actually even nine dimensions. Depends on the theory. But let's look in four dimensions. So let me take a theory that looks very much like the one I introduced at the beginning. This is uh, a gauge Yukawa theory. So I have, in fact, a gauge interaction of the fermions. I have the uh, Yukawa, and I have the uh, interaction of the Higgs. Now, think of this as QCD plus a Higgs, right? In this case, the Higgs does not carry color, so the Higgs is uh, colorless. But it does carry some self-interaction. This is uh, the uh, group theoretical structure of this theory in terms of the field content and the exact uh, quantum global symmetries of the theory. As you can see, this theory looks very much like UCD. I only added, if you want, an elementary mason to the theory. And I want to, I want to see whether this theory can lose asymptotic freedom, but enact asymptotic safety. Because I want to prove a result, I will actually uh, I will go into uh, the large number of colors, large number of flavor limits, such that the ratio is a continuous variable, and I can use it as a control parameter for my theory. So this is the way you prepare your coupling. This is the Yukawa. This is uh, the uh, single trace, and this is a double trace operator. And this is the gauge interactions. Okay. And uh, as I promised, I'm taking the uh, I'm taking the Veneziano limit, which means infinite number of flavors and infinite number of colors, so that the ratio is a continuous parameter. Our loop, and this is the normalization time, depending on the coefficient b. I can either have um, asymptotic freedom, if B were positive, and, uh, at least for the gauge coupling. It wouldn't make automatically a complete asymptotically free field here. Okay. So, but in the gauge, it could be asymptotically free. Or I could actually, by tuning the number of flavors, I can lose asymptotic freedom exactly at the same value where it happens in QCD. And typically, we never really wanted to use this theory. Right? I was told since I was like, young, younger, that, um, that please stay away from these tiers, right? If you want to do model building, use asymptotic freedom. Because we don't know whether these tiers are well defined ultraviolet. Because it has a Landau pole. Now, let me define for you a parameter, a small parameter, which is going to be the distance from the loss of asymptotic freedom. And let me choose this parameter to be very, very small so that I can have controllable perturbation theory in epsilon. 
And let me ask whether, for example, high order corrections can professionally fix the uh, fixed point. Now, I, look, I go and look at the second coefficient in the gauge. Keep in mind, this is a bit more complicated than just a gauge, a BU curve, and so forth. So. And now, what happens is that if C, if B were, minus B is positive, if C were negative and alpha G were small, then yes, I could in fact imagine a Benzax type ultraviolet fixed point. However, there was a theorem. It is impossible to do this in uh, gauge theories with fermions alone. This was demonstrated by Caswell, as uh, David Gross told me. They were afraid, in quote, unquote, that something like that could happen, so they wouldn't, push very, they wouldn't have pushed very hard for asymptotic freedom. But he came back empty-handed. He said, look, it's a beautiful paper. If you have a gauge theory with fermions in arbitrary representations, the C coefficient will never be such that you can have a controllable ultraviolet fixed point so at least in perturbation theory, there are no asymptotic safe theories. And then it makes the typical mistake of a theoretical physicist. He proves the theorem, and then at the end he says, I would expect that the same happens with scalars. But he didn't prove that. So let's look at what happens when I add the, as soon as I have scalars in this case, I might have, and like in this case, you have interactions, right? Now you see that I already took the large, uh, the Veneziano limit. This is the essence of the Caswell theorem. You see the this coefficient when the epsilon is positive, and I've already lost the synthetic freedom, can never change sign. So he was right. You cannot balance alpha g to the first coefficient. But now when you have the Yukawa interactions, you get the negative contribution. And this comes from the, from the exchange with the Higgs. Of course, you also have to look at the beta function of the Yukawa, and you see that, again, a negative com contribution that. By the way, this is what you like from complete asymptotic uh, freedom. So it's actually happening a similar thing here. And you see that these two, now you can set them to zero. You cannot always do, but in this particular theory, you, you can. And you look for the zero, and now you discover, of course, a Gaussian fixed point at the origin, which is QED lack. I will call this non abelian QED because I lost asymptotic freedom. But I also uh, get an interacting ultraviolet fixed point, which I can professionally expand in epsilon. At this point, I have a Taylor expansion in epsilon. Of course, it's still an asymptotic series, but if epsilon is sufficiently small, all the instanton correction will go like e to the minus 1 over epsilon. So they will be exponentially uh, vanishing. And therefore, I can trust the Benzakish fixed point. Of course, higher terms here will be corrected by next next leading orders so forth so on, but not the leading orders. So we can prove that. And this is, in fact, you, uh, the, 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 the location of the fixed point is a function of epsilon, right? And you can see how the next leading order, next next leading order changes slightly location when epsilon becomes big, but not in the in a controllable regime of a small epsilon, as it should be. Now, um, it's fun when you have a theory to be able that what well, you can calculate, let's calculate everything that could be interesting. So I can, for example, look at the scaling exponents, which tell me how fast I reach the fixed point. Having two couplings at the moment, I have one uh, relevant directions and one irrelevant directions from the ultraviolet fixed point point of view. Okay? You can see that the ir irrelevant directions is quadratic. And this is the direction, like in QCD, drives you toward the infrared. So this is the relevant direction. This is the irrelevant. And, and this is a true ultraviolet fixed point where it has, is, uh, is a, it has uh, basically one dimensional critical surface, which is case is a line, and it's exactly this. So which means that in the deep ultraviolet, along this, if you go along this line, you reach the ultraviolet fixed point, the gauge coupling, the Kava coupling freeze. As you go at low energy, you go to a non-interacting field here. Here you could put mass of quarks, mass of scalars. You can deform the Gaussian fixed point to make something like QCD. Actually, I can reconstruct QCD if I want to. And in the ultraviolet, the theory will not have the asymptotics of QCD. So, and as you know, experiments have never proved QCD to be asymptotically free. They only showed that it works around here. So, in fact, I can, in principle, complete QCD in an asymptotically safe quantum field theory, even within perturbation theory. This is the irrelevant direction. It tells you basically that on the line of physics, called all the separatrix, you will actually have an exact asymptotically safe quantum field theory. 
The next, next leading order. I'll make this a bit brief, but it's very interesting part, and it, you know, it would require much more than an hour to go through it. But the point is that you have a, a next, next leading order, which means three loops in the gauge, two loops in your cava, one loop in the self coupling. The self coupling start running, so I can possibly neglect them. One is a single trace, one a double trace. It's a well-known fact that the double trace in the large and limited becomes a spectator coupling, which means you can solve it at the end once you solve for the first three. And these are the back reactions on the three loops for the gauge and two loops on the Ukava of the second coupling. You can see that because the Higgs is neutral, the only, uh, gauge ca only coupling that fills it is, in fact, the Ukava coupling. And it comes only from the, as promised, uh, alert in the Venetian limit from the single trace. So I need to solve the problem of gauge Yukawa single trace and then plug it back in a double trace. This is the fact that the double trace is, you know, is typically a spectator. Now, I ask you to trust me on that, but you should never trust anybody. So, uh, and since it's a calculable field theory, I urge you to go and check. So, right? uh, just in the spirit of going to be fast. But you can demonstrate that there are several fixed points that need to pass a number of consistency conditions, and one survives. Okay? So it's not obvious that you automatically, uh, the fact when you have a, a scalar uh, fermion field theory, the fact you have a fixed point, even in perturbation theory, doesn't guarantee you that you have a fixed point. You can have a coleman weinberg mechanism, you can have several things you need to actually uh, controllably check that. Once all these checks have been done, you demonstrate that, in fact, there is still a fixed point in all the couplings. So the theory is a complete asymptotically safe quantum field theory. These are the critical expo the scaling exponent for all of that. And again, the surface is one dimensional, which means that the gauge coupling drives the dynamics here. A bit like in complete asymptotically free, it is the gauge coupling that forces the theory. So gauge is, is a good thing. Or it's not the bad thing. But the Higgs here ties the theory together, because with other scalars, the theory will have a landau pole. So for the first time, you have a dynamical reason for having scalars into the theory. If uh, you're coming from it, you know, the background I come from, like Technicolor, you don't like scalars. <laughs> They're a nuisance. <laughs> In this case, scalars are actually needed for the dynamics, and not for supersymmetry. Now, if uh, this is actually a three-dimensional uh, phase diagram where you also see the uh, single trace, the uh, gauge coupling at UCAL, uh, reaching indeed the ultraviolet fixed point, and this is the projection in the alpha y of uh, G coupling. Fine. Now, uh, once you have two fixed points, you can always define a globally defined line that links two fixed points. It's typically a non-perturbative statement, but in this case, you can solve it. And it's uh, globally defined, also known as separatrix, because it separates different region in parameter space here, different region of physics. Uh, and if I project the beta function over this line for both the gauge and the Ukawa, because of the dimension is one, you can, in fact, show that uh, the asymptotically safe behavior, the beta function, indeed, have a neutral value, the fixed point, the one you were actually uh, hoping to get in beta g, beta y, but actually even in the scalar couplings, right? They all have the same behavior. And in fact, a more dramatic way to show that is I can just show the running. Typically, I'm very wary to, wary to show running of couplings because couplings are not physical quantities. But in Benzac's regime, you can actually controllably show them too. You should always show physical uh, quantities that, for example, critical exponents and so forth. So. This shows that that is correct. Now, uh, the, uh, you can also see that the double uh, trace uh, coupling is negative, and you could be worried about the column of member, but we have calculated that. And because the sum of two couplings is positive, the theory uh, is well defined even in the ultraviolet. Very good. So as I said before, uh, in my eyes, it was the first time where I saw the need for, of scalars to make the theory fundamental. I was also sure what can happen even without scalars, at least that's a conjecture. It's no longer as precise as this. Okay. Very good. Now, I would like to be able to calculate everything, and this is a bit more pedagogical. I would like to know to calculate the uh, A function and on this theory, which I can. And how do I do that? I know that if I take a, a conformal field theory, in this case, it can be thought as the trivial field theory, right, without interactions. Then even the quantum corrections on a trivial field theory gives me a marginal operators, so marginal deformations. 
That I will consider as uh, going away from the conformal field theory. And I will upgrade the just a technical uh, trick the couplings to be a function of the space time and make a conformal transformation, which is equivalent to, to a, in this case, dilation of the uh, metric, tensor metric, and I will redefine the couplings as a function of the scale. Under this variation, I can uh, calculate, at least formally, the, the variation of the, of the uh, generating function of the theory. And this is uh, the, what you get in general. Okay, so this is uh, the essence of uh, the fact that you have that the trace of the energy momentum tensor is proportional to the beta function of the theory in a trivial background. But in a non-trivial background, you, 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 you get these extra corrections. This is the Euler density, the Einstein tensor, and sigma, and all uh, the chi's, this uh, symmetric metric, they now become function of the gauge couplings. Even though you have a background, these functions are well defined even in flat space. That's all the trick. Okay, so it's a trick to calculate this object by putting this theory into your background. And if you do two wild transformations, you know that because of the bigger nature of the wild anomaly, two independent uh, uh, consecutive transformation of wild, uh, of, of wild, uh, wild transformations commute. And that you can use it to relate, relate couplings and have a so-called gradient flow in the end. I can define over this function, the A function, which was a coefficient of the Euler term, and the beta function, which now becomes a vector of your space. So already think about the beta function of a theory are not fundamental quantity. They're a vector space. Fundamental quantity will be scalar quantities, like an A function. But you need to correct it by... Uh, by minus wb, and w is another one form. If you differentiate now this a tilde function, so the a theorem, is, as uh, one of my students used to say, is, it, the name is wrong in, 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 many, in many ways. It was never a, it was an a tilde, it was never a theorem, so forth. So. <laughs> but in perturbation theory, we can prove it. So the variation of a tilde with respect to the coupling uh, can be now, is proportional to the beta function. For a gauge of a theory, this term vanishes. And you can then calculate also the derivative of the A tilde with respect to the energy log of the scale. And you for, get a quadratic form. Now, you immediately see that if chi were positive, this leads to a negative monotonically decreasing uh, quantity. You can show this in perturbation theory. But beyond perturbation theory, you need to uh, perhaps uh, use analyticity in, uh, in, the, in, in the optical theorem. And this is a bit more delicate. So I'll be using this in perturbation theory. And since I was calculating a theory, a fixed point in perturbation theory, the A variation better be positive. So I will do that for uh, the theory then. Now you see that I will calculate A in ultraviolet minus A in infrared. And this is the value you get. It's directly proportional to this order, to the scaling exponent of the theory, to the relevant scaling exponent of the theory, up mean minus a sign, I mean, multiplied by minus one. Uh, and this is a fact that we already checked that the next leading order is not automatically the scaling exponent. So unfortunately, that's not uh, general. And chi is a calculable quantity. So I will say that uh, we also calculated other things, like the bootstrap for the composite operator so for so on. This theory is a well-defined conformal field theory in four dimensions, which is indeed asymptotically safe. Now. Once again, let me just, uh, once you have a theory, it's fun to check other things. Like, let me calculate, for example, the thermodynamics of this theory and see how does it look. Because, you know, different from QCD, this theory is not as an interacting ultraviolet fixed point. So how is it the thermodynamics in ultraviolet and that how, how that depends on the temperature? It's something that uh, was worked together with Dirk Rischke. And this is the pressure to the next, next leading order. Again, uh, calculated now as a function of t, and already in the Veneziano limit. So this is the pressure. You see the, immediately that the next, next leading order, you get the well-known non-analytic terms. And uh, this is the idea of gas limit. And this is the next leading order term. And this is the next to next leading order term. Right? In this theory, there are Fermion scalars and gauge interactions. Now, this is the, for different epsilon, this is the, the pressure normalized to the, uh, to the uh, zeroth order pressure, uh, this, the, and 
you can see that uh, the radius of convergence of finite temperature worsens compared to the radius of convergence of the theory in absence of finite temperatures, as well known, uh, because the, uh, you have a non-analytic expansion. Out of that, I can, of course, calculate the immediately the entropy density of the theory. And it's nice to plot S minus P because this is directly proportional to the uh, beta function of the theory at zero temperature. Right? So it's actually a way to measure the beta function if you were able, for example, in, on the lattice, to calculate independently the entropy density and the pressure. But another interesting application is to check the F theorem. I don't know many of you is a quantity with that, but something that on and off people discuss. That too was never a theorem. That is a conjecture, and I would say on worse standing than the A, because A, at least for supersymmetric field theory, is considered to work. Uh, so this was put forward some time ago by Tom Appaquist, Cornish Maltz, and he tells you that if you count the degrees of freedom according to the uh, coefficient of the free energy, which is nothing but than the, the pressure divided by T to the fourth times 90 over pi square, this coefficient intuitively cancels the number of degrees of freedom of your theory. Right? So the infrared should be less than the ultraviolet. Well, I have an asymptotic gray field theory. This is true for a number of asymptotically free field theories. So let's check if it's true for an asymptotically safe. Right? So we did that. I spared for you the, uh, thing, and we don't seem to see that is the case. Please double check the results too. I mean, we feel confident about that. So F is violating an asymptotically safe quantum field theory. Of course, you could say, well, but it's an asymptotic safe field theory. Why do I care? Perhaps F doesn't apply there. But the A theorem works, right? So you have a function that actually the difference is indeed positive, even if an asymptotic ACA field theory. So there is no reason to doubt that it should work in principle also for an asymptotic ACA field theory. How am I doing? Perfect. Yeah, excellent. So, so far I presented everything which was uh, under control. Now it's always nice to think a little bit ahead and, for example, take QCD, just QCD. I change a number of col uh, flavors, and in particular, I could also change a number of colors. It's no, no problem with that. And generally, you plot this diagram, right, which is, uh, there is certainly a, a, a line above which you lose asymptotic freedom. And this is uh, you know, an exercise for a master student. Right? So when does QCD lose asymptotic freedom? This is 11 over. Uh, over to NC, and then if you uh, go a bit, uh, grow a little bit older, you can also say that just below this line, and in particular in the Veneziano limit, I can uh, sorry in the in the right, exactly, in the Veneziano limit, I can prove that there is a, an infrared interactive fixed point, and then uh, you can uh, you expect this at one point to end, and you make what is known as a conformal window. That's the traditional conformal window for which number of lattice uh, efforts has gone for the past 10 years to investigate that. So question is, is it over? Is that the only window we can imagine to have? Even if you were to do that, I mean, which is very hard in any case. Well, there are indications, not as solid as in the case, uh, I mean, certainly not as proved as before, where if you go to infinite number of flavors, you might enact an ultra-valid interactive fixed point, a finite number of colors. Now, one thing I can say is that if I assume that there is a large enough QCD uh, as an asymptotic as a fixed point, then because there is no Ben Sachs ultra -valid fixed point, there must be a critical number of flavors, right? So I'm just using the fact that since I know that in perturbation theory I cannot get by casual an ultra-valid interactive fixed point, there must be a critical number of flavors above which that has to up. So there might be, from there on, an asymptotically safe regime. So the conformal window of 2.0 might look more like this. Because if I look at the conformal field theory, that could be like that too. Right? So we only plotted the lower one. But there probably will be also an upper one, I mean, where you, the theory becomes safe. And on general grounds, without even doing a computation, I can uh, say that uh, I would expect a critical number of flavors about which the theory uh, is asymptotically safe. There must be an unsafe region 
Well, the theory cannot be used as a fundamental field theory. It can be as a low energy effective field theory, non abelian QCD, sorry, non abelian QED. And I don't know the order of the first transition here. It could be continuous, it can be first order, it could be all orders. We studied with, uh, Pika, with Claudio Pica and with Daniel something up here where you can have some kind of control. I'm not completely confident about that. I mean, the infinite number of flavors beta function needs to be uh, better understood. But nevertheless, that would be the, what I would consider the conformal window of 2.0. Very good. So this, uh, now we leave the realm of uh, non-supersymmetric field theory and try to step into uh, supersymmetric safety or unsafety. Everything's clear so far? I hope I was going, you know. Not too fast. I tend to, sp to speak fast as Italian. <laughs> Very good. OK, so I've used perturbation theory so far. And when I didn't use perturbation theory, I was very careful in telling you that was a conjecture. Okay. So please don't go around and say that was an exact result. It was not for the QCD case. But it is for the uh, gauge recovery theory. Of course, you know, uh, as soon as you have a theory for which even in perturbation theory you have a, a precise result you can trust, you, will, you typically expect that if you supersymmetrize, you make it better. Right? How many times you heard, well, of course, in supersymmetry it's going to work better, or I can go beyond perturbation theory. So let's go and see. So what can I use in supersymmetry that I cannot use automatically in, for example, the theory I showed you before, like QCD, a different number of flavors. But certainly, even if for those theory, I could in principle discuss the unitarity constraints. But that will be trivial, because in perturbation theory, we'll never really violate that. Right. So I will want to go beyond perturbation theory. So I'll, I know that operators that belong to unitary representation of the superconformal group typically, actually always, have to uh, I need to abide some lower bounds. An interesting one is for the one of spin zero operators. So the, di the dimension of the operator must be always larger or equal to zero, and you get equal to one only for a non-interacting field. Now, again, this is a specific thing of supersymmetry. Carol primary operators, I mean Carol operators, have their dimensions and the R charge, which is nothing but than the U1 axial charge of this theory, which in, in the case of supersymmetry, there is a special U1 axial, which is in the same super multiplet of the conformal anomalies. In this case, you can calculate it by knowing just the R charge. And that's, if you want, one of the uh, big uh, um, strong points for supersymmetry. I cannot do this for uh, non supersymmetric field theories, there is not an exact relation between the uh, dimension of the operator and an axial charge. And it's very easy and, quote unquote, very easily understood in supersymmetry because trace anomaly and axial anomalies get related in supersymmetry. And because axial anomaly is an ABJ anomaly, is one loop exact, that immediately you know, uh, makes the trace anomaly richer. In QCD or non supersymmetric quantum field theory, that's not true. This is to do also with the homomorphicity of the theory. Okay. For example, if you have a, the square, I mean, if you have a, a Kara superfield, which is my generalized quarks, right? Now, besides the quarks, you also have the quarks. You have also a relation that tells you that uh, the, uh, the dimension of the operator associated to the R charge, which is automatically now fixing for you the uh, anomalous dimension of, of your field. This I can forget again in, in non supersymmetric field theories. Okay. This is one thing I'm going to use. The other thing I'm going to use are central charges. Which central charges, in principle, you can use? In principle, you can use any linear combination of these central charges, but these ones I'm going to show to you are interesting because they abide the positivity conditions huh? and they derive from the stress energy stress anomaly. One of that is, the, again, the A function, which is now the supersymmetric version of that. And all of them depend for a conformal field theory on the R charge of the theory, or all the R charges of the theory. Now, the A of R is a conformal anomaly of a superconformal field theory, and it's nothing but 
that uh, you can show that uh, the uh, anomalies associated to, to the tooth anomaly conditions for the UNR symmetry. Okay. It is, if, the way you derive it is because of the coefficient proportion to the square of the dual the Riemann curvature. This is his own uh, expression. Right? It's uh, trace u and cube minus trace u. And this is uh, the short end notation for that. There, there is also a more uh, specific expression in terms of the air charges. Then it's a C function, and this is a proportion to the square of the vial tensor. And that's the expression. And again, it's very similar to the A, but with different coefficients for the, uh, the anomalies. The, this one is a linear combination of the U1 cubed and U1. I mean, typically, the U1 we also call a gravitational anomaly. B of R is associated to the flavors of the theory, right? It's a proportion to the square of the flavor of symmetry field strength. And you can think about this as a, indeed one U1, uh, a triangle with one U1 and two gauged flavor symmetries in the end. And that actually is what gives you that. The A theorem is an extra condition. All this function must be positive of the conformal fixed point. But A abides at one further condition. That's B and C don't. And this is due to Cardi. It's that delta A must be positive. Good. So let's calculate delta A for a generic quantum field theory, both in the ultraviolet and, intra and infrared at the fixed point. Now, this is the generic expression you have where Ri is the dimension of uh, the matter field. For example, if this were uh, quarks, this would be uh, Nc. This is, now, you see that this coefficient, the first coefficient is always positive. The plus sign is for an asymptotically safe quantum field theory. The minus sign is for an asymptotically free. So if you're doing the cyborg phases in infrared, you'll be using the minus sign because you have an, an interacting fixed point in infrared and an ultraviolet free fixed point. And that tells you that there is a change in sign that you need to require for the other term to be positive. Now you immediately see the, the, the problem. And now, this is actually the, the essence of why it's harder to make asymptotic as if field theory is in supersymmetry. Okay? It is that it's stronger constraint for an asymptotically safe quantum field theory than it is, than the case of an asymptotically free. The reason being that at least one of the R charges needs to be very large for it being asymptotically safe. While for asymptotically free, the R charge needs to be small, but that's good because that's what you get already almost from perturbation theory. Make sense? And that is the uh, issue. Okay. Now I go slowly to construct the uh, beta functions of my theory. And again, I can show that the gauge coupling beta function are proportional to the ABJ anomaly, where now the anomalies of EU1 are charged and two gauge, uh, and two gauge, uh, and two gluons. Okay. And you can see that they all relate to triangle anomalies, as I was saying, because in the supersymmetry they get related with the trace anomaly. And this is the expression where T of G are the uh, normalizations of the quadratic generator, uh, of the trace normalization of my generators. For example, in QCD, this will be N, and this is if there's a fundamental representation, this will be one half. Okay. If I have also Yukawa couplings, in this case you have uh, Yukawa like interactions, then you have another beta function which is actually proportional to the R charge of the operator that makes up your. Uh, Yukawa uh, interactions, minus two because this is, has to be always uh, normalized to two. And the beta function, when it manages, it constrains the R charge of the operator to be equal to two. Make sense? I mean, I'm redu in, in, in supersymmetry, I'm reducing most of the things to algebraic things, right? In the, in the first case, I had to calculate the beta function and show that. That I can show in general that certain things cannot happen. So let me take the most naive generalization of uh, the work with Daniel, which is a super QCD with uh, an elementary meson. Now, super meson, you can see that the, this, this part of the table is the same. But because you have a gluino, you also have a U1R symmetry. What makes the difference here, really, is the gluino and, and then, of course, the supersymmetry in the end. Now, you immediately know that, uh, you can immediately check that you lose asymptotic freedom when an F is larger than 3C. And I am allowed to add a superpotential to this theory that 
allows you to have uh, an X interaction. And in this theory, I cannot have self-coupling. So in principle, my life will be easier because I don't need to check whether self-coupling are asymptotically safe. It would be enough to prove it for the u and the, and, the, and, and the gauge coupling. Right? So of course, I first do the most naive things which calculate the uh, imperturbation theory of the beta fungi. And you find out that, unfortunately, in this case, the u interaction is not strong enough to do it. And this we knew since a long time. So this theory, at least, like UCD, cannot have a perturbatively trustable uh, ultraviolet fixed point. But perhaps it could happen perturbatively, right? I just told you QCD could, in principle, do that. Maybe this can happen. In supersimilar, I can just declare that that happens and check whether the conformal field theory exists, which means passes all the tests I just showed it to you. Let me do, let me do that. So assume a new perturbative in fixed point emerges, OK? Then I can calculate, for example, the dimension of the uh, Kara superfield H, which is a gauge singlet. And this object, when NF is larger than 3 in C, violates the unitarity bound. Oops. So maybe this theory doesn't have an ultraviolet fixed point, but not so quick. Because I might be lucky that at the moment where I hit the conformal fixed point, the u interactions have disappeared. The Higgs decouples. And then this is no longer a constraint. And there are cases like that. So although violates the unitarity bound, there is a potential loophole. H is free and decouples at the fixed point. So I need to study, therefore, the theory without the Higgs. And only if that theory without the Higgs also does not have a conformal fixed point, then I am home safe. But this theory without the Higgs is super QCD. Now I'm actually studying the uh, cyber when you lost asymptotic freedom. Cyber only showed it to you the conformal window for infrared fixed point. But it didn't tell you what happened when you lost asymptotic freedom. So let's see the end of the story on the other side of the line. Super QCD. So you can immediately show that the unitarity band is not sufficient. What does it mean? That I can construct all the uh, gauge singlet operators that defines my modular space. And which are baryonic operators and mesonic operators, and all and behold, they all pass the unitarity test. So in principle, this theory could have a conformal fi fixed point. That would be very nice. There is something that, however, doesn't uh, speak in favor of that. And that is the A function. If you now calculate the variation of the A function, you find out that it violates the bound. So if you assume the ultraviolet fixed point exists, then delta A will be negative. This will be a good asymptotic and safe counterfeit theory, period. So now I prove that also the theory with the Meissner wouldn't do it. You can generalize that. Uh, so we can show that another being a super QED with and without a X cannot be asymptotically safe. C'est la B. So at best, these are theories that you can consider as a low-energy effective theories. Remember, Cyberg used those, but only as infrared field theories, not as ultraviolet, as effective interactions. You can do that. Like the Carrel Lagrangian. You don't care that the Carrel Lagrangian does not have any safety in itself, but you can use the low energy. Okay. You can then generalize using a maximization because there are cases where the R charge cannot be calculated, and therefore you need to have another principle to fix the R charge of the theory. This typically happens when you have, for example, a joint mat. So, key points so far. H plus Fermi plus scalar theories can be fundamental at any energy scale, either because they can be completely asymptotically free or because they could be completely asymptotically uh, safe. In either case, gauge interactions are essential to make the theory fundamental. So perhaps it's not by chance that we are ruled by gauge interactions. Simultaneously, however, if you lose asymptotic freedom and gauge interactions alone cannot do it, then at least in perturbation theory you seem to want a scalar. Outside perturbation theory, you can still do it without scalars. But it's not a proof. The results, both for complete synthetic freedom and complete synthetic safety, presented so far, are based only on perturbation theory. And when I couldn't do it, I used supersymmetry to check whether that wasn't possible. So we can say that we discovered the UV complete non abelian quantum uh, QED like theory. So non B and QD theories can be fine. There's absolutely no problem about that. I mean, ultraviolet. Um, the n equal to 1 SUSY 
uh, cause interiors are unsafe though. And that I can prove it to non-perturbatively beyond. Uh, for any NF and an NNC provide NF is larger than 3NC. Also show that uh, so the result for the asymptotic is safe thermodynamics, which is uh, an interesting stuff. We can do many other things on that. That shows, for example, that you violate this uh, conjecture of the F theorem. So there is no reason to enact it. I just conjectured for you uh, a potential uh, co QCD conformal window version 2.0, because in fact, I don't, reason, I don't see why I should always spot only one window. <laughs> It could be two, one for asymptotic safety and one for asymptotic freedom. And lattice can do both. There's absolutely no problem. Actually, it's not very hard to change the number of flavors on a code. And I'm rephrasing it a bit my need of scalars because I show that we need the scalars in perturbation theory for theories like QCD where you lose asymptotic freedom, but you might actually not need them at all. So in this case, the Higgs is a bit like the shoelace, right, when you lose asymptotic freedom, right? So it is needed to make the tie the, theory, the, tie the theory together. Right? It's not a nuisance in the theory, I should say. It is a nuisance for other kind of uh, reasons. I did not solve the hierarchy problem. But if you set that for aside for a second, then actually you can need the Higgs for different reasons. So as look, I mean, there are many, many things to do, and we only scratch the surface. Uh, you can extend to other carrier gauge theories and space-time dimensions. Some of this has already happened. Others are on the way. Uh, there are interesting things about the grand unified theories like SUSI because some of these actually are not asymptotically free. And, uh, so what happens to those? Uh, we have the result, but it's for another talk. I would love to start calculating with some loops, critical exponents, and even new maximum elicity MHVs, maximum elicity validating amplitudes for this theory. There are many things that make this theory very close to n equal to 4, because it has a neutral value fixed point. But n equal to 4, that is a fixed point for all values of alpha. You can go beyond perturbation theory if you don't have SUSI. You can use lattice, dualities, holography, truncations. It's, it's up to you. Um, you can think of new ways of unifying flavor because if you think about it, right, I had one, all you covers above the mass of the Higgs will actually unify in a single interaction. You cover scalar interactions and gauge coupling, they all now dictated by the same scaling exponent of the theory. As George himself said that, that's better than grand unification because even in ordinary grand unification, you only unify gauge but not self interactions and you covers. In this case, you have that the condensed matter physics of that predicts a universal behavior for all the couplings. Whether this happens in reality is all another story. You can play with now different models of dark matter inflation. And of course, it lends some hope also for gravity, although it's a complete, theory, a complete different theory in practice. Thank you.